Okay, good. Let's get started. So welcome to this uh, seminar number 70. Um, the speaker today is Professor Avik Ghosh uh, from the University of Virginia. And he'll talk about computing in time using magnetic excitations. Um, professor Ghosh is professor at the Charles Brown Department of Electrical and Computing Engineering and the Department of Physics at the University of Virginia. Uh, he did his PhD in condensed matter theory at uh, the Ohio State University, and then held a postdoctoral fellowship in electrical engineering at Purdue. Um, he is the uh, University of Virginia site director of the NSF uh, IUCRC Center uh, on Multifunctional Integrated Systems uh, Technology, um, or MIST. Um, Professor Gosh has authored uh, well over 100 refereed papers and a book uh, called Nanoelectronics, a Molecular Review in the area of computational nanomaterials and devices. He has given um, well over 100 invited lectures worldwide he is a fellow of the Institute of Physics, a senior member of the IEEE, and has received the IBM Faculty Award, the NSF Career Award, and a 2006 Best Paper Award from the Army Research Office. He has also received the University of Virginia's All University Teaching Award, and his groups work with Columbia University on uh, Negative index behavior in graphene was voted by the editors of Physics World as one of the top 10 research breakthrough, breakthroughs in 2016. So with this, uh, I'll hand it over to you, Havik. Please go ahead with your talk. I look forward to it. Thank you very much, Kirill. Thanks, Zin. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be able to talk uh, about some of our work. Um, um, let me start off by just kind of doing the usual, which is acknowledging the people who really did all the work, which I get to talk about, which is the students and postdocs in the first line from our group. Uh, we collaborate a lot with other groups. So the second line is some of the uh, groups that we've collaborated with on this particular project at UVA, and then also the faculty we've been collaborating with and the researchers from the other universities. And of course, over the years, our fundings come from various different sources. Uh, all the way from the DOD to National Science Foundation to uh, the Semiconductor Research Corporation. So just a quick uh, description of what our group does uh, before I go into the particular topic today. So we use um, uh, transport theory, basically non-equilibrium physics to look at uh, various different systems. And these are like the five grand challenges our group uh, pursues, has been pursuing over the years. One is, you know, 2D materials, what can we do uniquely with it? Uh, magnets, what limits ultimately scale memory? Neuromorphic computing, can we do uh, brain-like computing in particular in time? Um, single photon detection, what limits the fundamentals of single photon sensing? And then some energetics of uh, thermal uh, transport. Um, I'll talk mostly about numbers two and three today. Not mostly, entirely about numbers two and three today. Uh, so just, in terms of the tools we use, uh, we do uh, modeling at various different levels and these all couple together. So we can do, let's say, this is an example of a Hoistler structure. We can do tide binding or density functional theory uh, for its bands, gets, that gives us the magnetic properties. This can then be put into a transport formalism. This is where we do Landauer type theories, non-equilibrium Green's functions to calculate torques and currents. And then this goes into micromagnetics, which again, we work at different levels from LLG to focal plank. And then finally, this all goes up into, you know, we try to come up with rather simplified equations at the end, and this goes all, all the way to SPICE, uh, where we can now look at the entire circuit into which the magnetic system is embedded and look at the energy and the overhead costs and so on. So really go all the way from DFT to SPICE. Now, so here's the outline of my talk today. So I will start by talking a little bit about energetics of magnet-based switching. And one of the points I want to mention is that there's a trade-off between energy and delay and reliability. And this is kind of understood empirically by people, but I just wanted to quantify a little bit. <clears throat> and that leads us to two paths. One is reducing the barrier. That's the volatile magnets. And there, the applications we are looking at is 
uh, stochastic neurons. And the application in particular is temporal inferencing. And the opposite end is trying to build up the barrier. And you do that by uh, creating defects such as domain walls and skirmions. And there the particular application we are using is what are called temporal state machines. Okay, let me start but with the energetics of magnet-based switching. <clears throat> Actually, even if I go further and look at the energetics of computing, this came out of a recent uh, decadal report from SRC, 2030 decadal report. And this is a talk that was given by Victor Zhernov. And I think the graph is very interesting because it shows you the energy production in the world and also the energy of computation uh, in joules per year. And the main take home message you see, these two are at a collision course, right? So basically what it's saying is that the energy uh, production in the world is being disproportionately utilized by computation. And, you know, and that's kind of the flip side of Zoom. You know, on the one hand, Zoom is helping us with fossil fuels, but then Zoom is actually leading to a lot more <laughs> energy consumption. So the question is, how do we cut down this energy consumption? And the main reason why this enormous energy uh, bottleneck happens is because any computation requires shuttling charges around. That creates friction. That creates heat. And this heat has just become prohibitive now. It's just the amount of heat that's generated. And I'll, I'll try to give a sense for where these numbers come from and you know, even in the context of a magnetic switching device. So uh, what I'll show you at the end of the talk is uh, what's a trend right now. You know, in the past, it used to be just building hardware and build software around the hardware, Boolean uh, you know, logic, and then you know, your von Neumann architecture on your standard CMOS. Now, because of the energy cost of computing, we have a new era right now, emerging era already there, where it's all about hardware accelerators. So you're creating accelerators that are no longer just for Boolean computing, but trying to specifically uh, service and accelerate specific kinds of algorithms, right? So here, and these are the two examples I'll talk about. One is temporal infer inferencing algorithms. The famous example of that is extended nonlinear Kalman filters. It's used in signal processing, et cetera. And in this particular picture, you're seeing some message that's being scrambled and you're trying to recover it. And what I hope to uh, convince you, or at least you know, submit to you is that one system that can uh, potentially do this is a low barrier soft magnet in a pull up, pull down network. When you take a bunch of these magnets, put them together with interconnects um, and use the white noise that comes from the magnet, that could be a drop in replacement for a Kalman filter. So that's the first part of my talk. And the second part is the opposite limit where you now try to create a high barrier. And then there are very specific algorithms. This is an example called the Dijkstra algorithm for graph optimization, picture taken from Wikipedia. And the high barrier magnets in this particular example, the example I'll talk about is skirmions or domain walls, solitonic excitations. These can actually be a, a good accelerator for these kinds of um, Dijkstra algorithms, graph optimization problems. Uh, because they are kind of a natural analog unit. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, the big picture of what I want to talk about. So let me go back to the energetics of computation. You know, why is it so hard? Say it's Q delta V. Uh, at the end of the day, no matter how you switch, you have to interface with CMOS, you have to move charges around, and that energy dissipation is Q delta V. Delta V is the amount of barrier that the electron drops by. Now, I'm not going to talk about reversible computing here. That can also be folded into this. But in the particular example we look at, you create some charge, you move it, and then it falls down, and then the dissipation is Q delta V. And the reason the heat cost is so large, which is why you're, you have to move into this accelerator business, is because Q and delta V are both very large. And delta V is set by uh, what is called reliability. You, know, you create, uh, let's say, a source and a drain, and you want to move the electron from source to drain. You want the barrier in between to be large enough so that the electron doesn't backflip on its own uh, thermally. So you need that barrier to be much larger than the thermal KT, uh, which is 25 millivolts. How much larger? Well, we want the error rate in the case of um, com you know, logic to be very, very tiny, 10 to the minus 12 or so. So that tells you it needs to be several times KT. So that's the delta V constraint. And then the Q constraint is basically drivability, that you need the charges to almost like a crankshaft and drive another element down the road, which drives another element down the road. In this particular case, that means you've got a bunch of transistors. So you have to charge up the gates of those transistors, but more importantly, you have to charge up all the metal interconnects in between. So there's a fairly sizable capacitance of all the interconnects that you need to charge up to that voltage. So if you just compute very simply, how many charges do you need to charge up your interconnect capacitances to uh, maybe several times KT, that comes to 1,000 or 10,000 KT, so many, many number of electrons. 
So there's this redundancy that you need many electrons to encode the uh, one bit of information. And that's what gives you Q delta B, this very large number. Now magnets potentially are, can bypass it because magnets are like charges that are stapled together. You know, there's internal magnetic uh, fields so that each spin rotates the other spins almost like a giant spin. And there are estimates that have shown that this, uh, if you take thousand spins or 10,000 spins and you try to rotate them, the internal cost is no longer 10,000 KT. Maybe it's only about 40 KT or so. But you can actually do a similar analysis for <laughs> switching off a magnet uh, with current, right? So STT RAM is one example. You have a MTG and you're driving a current and the current is getting polarized by a, a fixed magnet. And then it's uh, uh, transferring the transverse uh, angular momentum to the free magnet, which is then switching. Now you can do a similar analysis. In this particular example, the equivalent of Boltzmann equation would come from what is called Fokker Planck. Uh, that's drift diffusion essentially. And it turns out for a perpendicular magnetic tunnel junction, you can solve it analytically. This was done by Bill Butler's group. And if you actually work out the impact of that equation, and I'll just give you the results, it basically says that you need, again, a fixed number of charges to drive crank up. It's almost like charging a capacitor, except in this case is the magnetization. And the minimum number of charges you need is given by this drivability, which is the angular momentum conservation that these other number of electrons coming in, their angular momentum is this, that must be equal to the target angle momentum. And then a little more if you have damping. Uh, and then there's this Boltzmann reliability. And that basically says that if you want low error rate, you have to overdrive the circuit to buy down the error rate. And this is an example that kind of shows it. This is showing the dynamic right error rate versus time for various currents. So if you are parked at one of these curves and you want to cut down the error rate, either you have to wait longer or you have to jump to a higher drive current. Either way, you have to put more charge in. And so that's basically what drives determines the charge. So you can do a very simple estimate. So this is a small iron magnet, let's say a 100 by 20 nanometer magnet. That's got about 10 to the power four spins. And you say, okay, I want an error rate of 10 to the minus nine, uh, 10 to the minus nine. What is the uh, amount of electrons I need to drive in that comes to about a million electrons? And if I want to switch it to about in one nanosecond, then the current density comes to about 50 mega amps per centimeter squared, so roughly what you see. So again, the high cost is because uh, you're sharing read-write lines and you're going through an oxide. So the oxide barrier is huge. Uh, you can cut it down by using SOT, spin orbit torque, but you'll get similar considerations. Basically, some of these terms will change. You replace the uh, polarization with a spin hall angle. There'll be some geometrical corrections, et cetera, that comes in. But at the end of the day, it'll again be a drivability equation from angular momentum conservation uh, between the electron and the target magnet and the Boltzmann uh, for your error rate. So if I want to cut down this charge, what, what do I do? So if you go back and look at that charge, that is proportional to the target volume. Uh, now you can cut down that volume by scaling the magnet, but then the thermal stability barrier also goes down. And that means your penalty is that the error goes up. In particular, the static error rate goes up, the retention becomes poorer. This is the super paramagnetic limit that we often talk about. So at this point, you're kind of uh, between a rock and a hard place. If you do want to get a high density, low volume, there are basically one of two uh, obvious processes. One is you try to figure out how you can play with a low barrier. Because you know, as you make it smaller, barrier goes down, can we utilize it? And that's where I'll show you that the area of probabilistic computing uh, is emerging that's trying to use the low barrier noisy nature of the magnet to do uh, probabilistic computing, computing in time probabilistically. And that's something's called the p-bits. And the other is the opposite limit is, can we actually restore non-volatility at scale, somehow bring up the barrier artificially? There's a few ideas out there. There's hammer where you temporarily lower a barrier with a, with a kind of a heat pulse, there's bit pattern recording. And then there's the one we are talking about, which is topological distortions called skirmions. And the idea there is that you try to engineer a topological barrier that gives you an additional, not absolute, but at least an additional stability that can get you some more uh, barrier. And then you can do uh, non-volatile magnet-based um, uh, applications. So let me start with the low barrier volatile magnets. And there the idea is, uh, we can generate uh, what is called a stochastic neuron for temporal inferencing. So here's what a low barrier magnet would look like. Essentially, it's a magnet which is circular. And so there's a, no shape anisotropy. And 
theory says that this can, uh, if you if you make the barrier height as small as let's say a couple of kT, then the uh, time for an electro, uh, for a spin to jump between these two states, basically it goes up and down, magnetization, can be as small as you know nanosecond to maybe 50 picosecond or so. Now, in principle, that's the number. In practice, of course, you see it's very challenging to make very tiny barriers. And that's one of the material issues that's ongoing. And these are experiments from Purdue and uh, together with uh, Ada Ono's group. So here, are these are experiments where you'll see that the experimental barriers are typically 10 to 20 kT. Um, and so that needs some special designing to make the barrier small, which is kind of the opposite of what industry has been doing. But if you can make this small, then what can you do, right? So the idea is then if you put this as one limb of a CMOS inverter, just imagine a pull-up, pull-down network, and one of the limbs is uh, uh, this magnet whose resistance is now fluctuating between high and low. Uh, then what will happen is it will shape this output characteristic and you put it through this kind of two inverters. Um, uh, it, it's, it gives you this noise and with an average that looks like a tan hyperbolic and this non-linearity is essentially coming from the pull up, pull down network from the transistors. So it's converting this into this uh, and it's an input it's V in V out plot. Right, and this is the equation that you see here. Basically, you have a tan hyperbolic, that's the average. Then there's some random noise, and then you kind of digitize it with the signum function. So it's got these three attributes. It's got the nonlinearity coming from the gate structure. It's coming, the stochasticity that's coming from the magnet, and it's got the digitization. Um, so the three of them together gives you what is called a binary stochastic neuron. This is an idea that came from Purdue. At least, you know, one of the ideas that came from Purdue. So what can you do with it? So the stochasticity allows you in time to sample the phase space quickly. And we have this kind of ergodic hypothesis in uh, StatMech that if you look at a time domain trace, that's supposed to be the equivalent of the ensemble trace, as long as you don't get stuck in metastable states. So that's the idea. So instead of just sampling phase space, you're sampling it in time. And then you collect a histogram that gives you the probability distribution and the probability distribution tells you the ground state, which is the lowest energy state. And you can use that to solve the ground states of various quadratic binary optimization problems, which can all be mapped into this kind of energy minimization or free energy minimization problem. So here's an example, you have three magnets, the toy example, they're coupled with these interconnects. Remember the interconnects are basically just connecting the transistors and you can program these interconnects. So let's say we can, and I'll talk about that in a second. If I make all these interconnects positive and then I just let the magnets proceed and I collect the samples over time, if it's ferromagnetic, which means all the interconnects are positive, then the ground state, the, the result ends up being a probability distribution. You see that the highest peaks are at the 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1 state, which are the up and down state. Those are the ferromagnets. If I make it anti-ferromagnetic, then you see that the probability distribution ends up being what is called a frustrated spin glass. It's either up, up, down, or up, down, up, or down, up, up. It's like 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. Uh, and it's equally distributed because none of them is uh, really a global minimum. Uh, so that you automatically get this out. Now, so the idea is then you can program this. There is a clear algorithm that converts any truth table uh, onto the corresponding adjacency matrix using uh, Boltzmann physics. Uh, so it's pre-programmed. And this is actually experiments from what I understand from Purdue that shows an AND gate that they have designed. And you can see that, you know, you let the magnets kind of, uh, in this case, three magnets proceed and you see that the final probability distribution from the taken samples taken over time do match the experiment. And you see that that gives you peaks only at the truth table values of the AND gate. So zero, zero gives you zero, zero, one gives you zero, one, zero, zero gives you zero, and one, one gives you one. And the other ones are small. If you sample more often, you'll get less error. You can do a few other things then. Once you can know how to construct an adjacency matrix, you can figure out different classes of optimization problems at different adjacency matrices. So for example, traveling salesman problem has one, the max squat problem has the other. And then you can use that to solve these kinds of problems using just this hardware of soft coupled magnets. Um, and an example of that, there's also something called invertible logic. So let's say you have an AND gate and you clamp your output to zero, and then your probability distribution should show all possible inputs that give you the output with that probability distribution. So you can kind of invert the logic. So this all was done by Purdue. And what we decided to do is take it a little bit further in the time domain. So what we did is we take that same noisy sample and run it through an analog buffer. This is like a current mirror. And then also have another inverter to create an inhibitory uh, structure. And by the way, the inhibitory was there in the previous graph also, if you want to get W less than zero, for example, you need the inhibitor. 
So what this does is this noise gets superimposed onto the gate characteristic. And then because the analog buffer, it just ends up looking like this. So the red curve is the output voltage. And you see it has the noise on it, but the noise is no longer binary. It's just a noise margin around the analog result. In other words, even the individual voltage values are analog and they track this kind of average value. And if you do the inversion, then that's what it looks like. So this is really an analog output, not digital zeros and ones. Uh, and we call this analog stochastic neuron. Okay, if you actually look at the time trace of this, this is the equation you get. And it looks very similar to the digital one, except that you don't have that signum function that binarizes it. And it has the tan hyperbolic that comes again from the gate. So there's this gain factor that comes from the transistor. And then there's this noise that comes from the MTG. Those are the two parameters you can play with. So now the question is, what kind of algorithm can you accelerate with this analog stochastic neuron? So there's this whole class of problems called state space temporal computing. So there is a state, for example, in the case of this case, the magnet, which is like a Markovian process. It depends on the previous state and depends on an input and it's got a noise. And then you sample that state at different times and that gives you a different variable Y. So X is like your internal memory of the system. Y is the readout. And from these two in the temporal computing domain, what you can do thing is things like trajectory prediction. So if you're given a trajectory, you can now in real time predict which way this is going to go. And there's a whole class of applications based on it, excellent common filters of a computer, et cetera, based on this state space temporal computing. Uh, let's take reservoir computing as an example. So in reservoir computing, you have a bunch of neurons. They all coupled through uh, these kinds of uh, weights. There's input weights. That's where the temporal signal comes in. And then here's the output. Now, what you're really doing is you're only playing with the output synaptic weights. You don't play with the ones inside the reservoir. You just keep them um, untouched. And then the idea is as different time slices of the input signal comes in, they get imprinted onto the different neurons. And so the neural ensemble has like an echo of the different time slices in it. And then you can just tune a few of the output parameters to kind of do a learning exercise. You don't need to do anything inside. And because of the high dimension that comes from the multiple slices, then you can use that to do kind of temporal inferencing. And this is the kind of equation you'll see in the literature if you want to look at these reservoir computing. And so there's a similar state space equation, which has a tan hyperbolic, and there's an observation uh, equation. Uh, and this will look very similar to the equations I wrote earlier. In fact, if you remember, so if I matricize it, these are the two equations in the matrix notation. There's an activation you need. Um, that's your neurons. You need a leak because you, want, uh, you don't want to have long-term memory and you want to have a noise. Um, and if you look at the equations we already developed for the analog stochastic neuron, that already captures the activation part and the noise part. And then remember, they are actually shaped through a network. Basically, it's the pull up, pull down network of a transistor. And those transistors are coupled through interconnects. And so you can play with the RC time constants of the interconnects and that controls the leak. Uh, so what you really want is the charging time and the discharging time to be a little bit different. And you want to, in this particular example, the integration time, which is the charging time of your gate has to be greater than the transistor switching time and the leak time for it has to be kind of uh, smaller than the magnet switching speed. So with these two, you can now get a this network to be uh, like a mapped onto this um, RC state equation. So hardware accelerator for this equation. So let's look at some applications. So these are emulated hardware. So we have a bunch of uh, magnet-like neurons that are coupled together and we are simulating them in MATLAB in some cases. This some cases SPICE, this is SPICE. Um, so you've got this test input, here's the reservoir output. And what you're seeing here is this orange input that's coming in. And this is showing you the time snapshot of the responses of the various neurons. And the main take home point is if you look at these different neurons, neuron three, nine, 11, they are capturing different facets of the temporal uh, information. For example, this one looks like the signal. This one is reading the edges. This one is actually looking, if I blow it up, this is almost looking like the inverse of the, the complement of the signal. So among all of these neurons, you get, you're get you capturing different facets of the complexity of the temporal uh, domain. And so you can now use this for various kinds of temporal um, inferencing. So I'll show you two examples. These all work done by um, Samir and Ganguly. Uh, 
so this is the first example, adaptive filtering. Uh, basically, you have a, a image that you learn and then you scramble it in real time and you want the system to kind of recover it. So here's your original image, that's this D function. You add a nonlinear transformation on it uh, and then you add a noise on it. So that's the distortion. And you let the reservoir try and figure out what the original recovered image is. And you know, there's a video I was running at the beginning. So that shows a real time trace. These are the snapshots. So what you see is that it was fed an eye and then the eye was scrambled and the system recovered the eye. Uh, and then once it moved from I to seven, uh, this system kind of uh, moved on to the seven. And each of these from my understanding is about four or five of the uh, uh, time steps of the sampling. Uh, and then you see the seven stays here and you kind of, again, seven is getting scrambled very poorly and it's kind of trying to recover. So this is an example called adaptive filtering. Another example is uh, uh, temporal autoencoders. Uh, so basically there the idea is you're giving it a test signal and it learns the test signal for a while. And then at one point you cut off the input and the output is being fed back as an input. And what you want is the system on its own to try and predict what the next step of the original test signal would be. Right, so it's predictive. And so what you're seeing here is in this case, a, a kind of a simple multi-frequency input was given for a while. And then at, this is where the testing stage happened. And you see in the background, the blue is what the reservoir would have, uh, the, the red is what the test signal would have done. And the blue is what the reservoir is predicting. And you can see without any knowledge of the input, just from the last output. And you can see uh, at least up to 10, 15, 20 steps, actually more than that. It is doing a decent job. And of course, after a while, it starts di you know, deviating from there. This is a more complicated signal. This is a subtly chaotic uh, equation called the uh, Mackay class. Again, you see the test signal coming in. And I think in this case, it's just a few of these 10 or so, if I'm not mistaken, uh, of these neurons, you're getting a fair amount of fidelity. And of course, if you increase the number of neurons, you get better and better predictability of these kinds of, uh, basically is recognizing the pattern and predicting the next step. Now you can quantify the performance of these things. So if you indeed get a one KT barrier, then the times are about you know 52 picoseconds to one nanosecond. Then you can say, okay, I wanna do, let's say that leads to about 20 giga samples per second. Each of them has a certain EDP. You've got about 3.3, three CMOS elements in there. So that's the energy delay product. And you can see, let's say the variance is acceptable after a hundred samples for an inferencing operation. So that leads to 200 million inferences per second. Uh, now, this is this good enough? Well, at least we can quantify it. Whether it's good enough depends on what the state of the art is and what the needs of the field is. And also whether we can actually accomplish this 52 picosecond to one nanosecond. If this becomes uh, microseconds to milliseconds, then this number goes down and then you're probably gonna be behind the state of the art. So there's a lot of lot kind of relying on our ability to keep this tau small. So that's the one example. Now let's go to the opposite example. And that's where we want to kind of keep the minor as small as possible, but we want to inflate the barrier height and then go back to non-volatility and see if we can do that. Now, how do you increase the barrier height while keeping the size smaller? And one way to do it is using these domain walls and skirmions. So this is work we've been pursuing for several years. Um, you know, we have a DARPA team uh, across UVA, uh, MIT, and NYU, uh, who have been looking at different facets of this work. And we have a little review article here. Uh, now, how do you create a large barrier in a magnet? So the first thing you can do is create a defect, basically a domain wall between up and down spins. And as you know, this domain wall size is given by a competition between ex ferromagnetic exchange Hans rule which wants the spins to be uh, either parallel or anti-parallel, but uh, it doesn't like them to be, so it wants to spread out the uh, spins as much as possible. So that is a gradua gradual uh, variation rather than abrupt variation. Whereas there's the anisotropy that wants the spins to be either up or down. And so it's a competition between these two. So that domain wall width in a very simple uh, analysis is given by the ratio of this uh, exchange stiffness to the anisotropy. Now, to this, we can add, now the problem is that alone would have worked because if I create a domain wall, which is very tiny, it has very small Q, and then we can use it for fairly low energy computation. This was the idea behind uh, the racetrack memory. But as you probably know, the problem usually is that these are one dimensional objects that tend to get pinned at the edges. So there's this creep domain and, you, and then you need an unpinning 
uh, threshold and after which you get a flow. So it's kind of moving by fits and starts. It's a very nonlinear process. So an alternate way is to create these kermions, which are these topological entities. And the way you do it is to add a spatial inversion symmetry breaking, spatial symmetry breaking. So in this case, for example, B20 solids in the right side, they have this internal kind of asymmetry. Uh, manganese platinum tin has a structural asymmetry. It's tetragonal unit cell. And then these ones like cobalt gadolinium are sitting on some kind of heavy metal which uh, has high spin orbit uh, coupling and it breaks the symmetry at the interface. So all of them, what they will do is create a symmetry breaking field. This is the charlotte moria field. And then you can say, okay, very simply, what would the spins do in response to this extra field? And you can do this, this simple mathematics um, and you can show that they will fo form these patterns, right? These are the 2D uh, excitations. People come up with what are called point carry maps, basically to map these out. So node saddle points and uh, limit cycles is what the usual language is in 2D uh, excitation physics. But these are the skirmions, right? So these, this is called a Niels skirmion. This is called an anti skirmion. It's called a block skirmion. And interestingly, each of these patterns and worlds maps onto a sphere, except one point called the block point. It can be mapped onto a sphere. Okay, so what does that do? You can actually quantify this a little bit more. You can say, okay, what is the number of windings around the circle in the Fermi circle? That's just given by calculating the overlap between two neighboring points, extracting a phase, and then integral of that phase gives you the winding number. Uh, and this is the Betty curvature and topological invariant like the Boss uh, Gauss, Gauss bonnet curvature for a topological object. You know that that. That curvature is what determines whether a donut is the same as a cup of coffee or not. So different arrangements of these spins map onto different winding numbers. So for example, skirmion has a winding number of one, anti skirmion has winding number minus one, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you can even further classify them by what is called the helicity. So within the skirmions, you can get Niels skirmions that look like this and block skirmions that look like this. Main difference being when it's going from up to down, does it rotate in plane or does it rotate out of plane, etc. Okay, so that's all the mathematics. Now, what has that got to do with anything real? Um, if you actually calculate the energetics, what you want, what I'll show you is that in the ferromagnet or ferrimagnet background, if you kind of tune your parameters right, you will get a, in the energy landscape, this energy versus radius, uh, you'll get a local minimum. That means you can stabilize a skirmion, an isolated skirmion as a metastable state in here. And the way you'd see that is if you, in order to get this kind of curvature, you need two things. You need a negative slope in the energy landscape and you need a curvature, both of them. And if you actually look at the different terms, what you find is the jalonski moria interaction is an attractive term that gives you a negative slope. And then the exchange stiffness in 2D has this one over R that gives you the curvature. And both of them, of course, depend on this skirmion number, NSK. So in a skirmion in 2D, you, you get these two terms that allows you to stabilize the skirmion. In fact, what is more interesting is if you play with the parameters, for example, you increase the jalinsky mori interaction, DMI, you get a deeper well that is more stable, <clears throat> but it also becomes bigger. And this will continue until at one point, this becomes a true ground state. And at that point, the skirmion breaks up into what is called a a uh, skirmion lattice or a labyrinthine pattern or another, that it becomes a true ground state. These are metastable states. <clears throat> okay, so the reason this is interesting is because of the topological mapping onto a sphere, it's a topological invariant, at least in free space, infinite space in the continuum limit. And what that means is if I try to rotate the skirmion and, and dissolve it, let's say I continuously try to uh, deform the spin so it melts into the background and becomes a ferromagnet, that's not going to be possible because this spins just keep rotating around the sphere. So you need to do something a little bit more radical. For instance, if you have a high current that uh, makes the skirmion hit a defect or an edge, at that point, the mapping onto the sphere does, is not perfect. Or if you make a very tiny skirmion where atomistic effects come in, those are the cases where the skirmion breaks apart. But modest currents, skirmions tend to move around defects. They have this inertia, and that gives you a lot more topological stability in theory. Okay, so how do we make the skirmion small? So here is a phase diagram. These are the parameters you can play with. You can play with magnetization. You can play with uh, um, anisotropy, et cetera. This is the stiffness. And let me just make sure I'm watching the clock a little bit. <laughs> um, 
So if you remember, the skirmion size depends on this domain wall width, which depends on something like a J over K. In this case, it turns out to be D over K, Shalinsky Moria over K. So one way to cut down the size of the skirmion is to reduce the anisotropy. Now the anisotropy actually has an additional contribution that comes from these stray fields or finding fields. Um, and that tends to oppose the anisotropy. So one way to cut down the effective anisotropy is to get rid of the saturation magnetization. And you can do that uh, in a kind of a tunable way in a ferry magnet, because in a ferry magnet, you can tune the magnetization by changing the temperature. So one su suggestion is to take a ferry magnet near compensation that would reduce the saturation magnetization. And indeed there's several experimental results here, including some from our collaborators that show that near compensation, indeed you start seeing this kind of uh, compensation behavior. These are experimental data from uh, Jeffrey Beach's uh, group in uh, MIT, and they see all the way up to 10 nanometer skirmions at room temperature. These are low temperature data from Ronming, and you see on less than 10 nanometer skirmions. And these are some emerging results from uh, our collaborators at uh, NYU and UVA, and they see this on manganese nitride, they see modest size skirmions. So, um, this seems to work and you can reduce the, you can also play with the DMI, jalinsky mori interaction by playing with the composition of the metal until layer. Um, uh, so there's some knobs you have. So a few things we learned uh, on skirmions, they can be fairly fast. In fact, you can work out the speed of a skirmion. Again, it depends on magnetization. So if you make the magnetization smaller, it shoots up and you can also play with the damping. Um, so again, in cobalt gadolinium, which is a ferry magnet, and in garnet antiferromagnets, domain walls, uh, researchers have reached very high speeds. This is Jeff Beach's group. Uh, our group has predicted uh, low damping in some of the hoisters, ferromagnetic hoisters, because those tend to be half metallic. So they have seem to have very low damping. Again, those would have very large speeds. Um, Professor Joe Poon's group has studied <coughs> the uh, the lifetimes of these skirmions. This is using the geodesic nudged elastic band method, which is something we've been collaborating on with uh, Professor Andy Kent's group as well. And you can see in these systems, again, the prediction is that for modest uh, size skirmions, 20, 30 nanometer skirmions, reasonably thick films, you can get fairly large lifetimes. You know, you can almost go up to a year or so. Uh, and of course, you may not even need a year or a decade, depending on the application for cache memory, for instance, you won't need that kind of lifetime. And then the Stability of the skirmion, big skirmions tend to be diffuse, thin ones tend to pin, but experiments from, again, Professor Beach's group seem to suggest that the they don't diffuse as much, you know, and this is a tricky thing to measure because there's, there's some drift in the image, but you can at least put an upper limit on the diffusion constant, which tends to be less than this number. And on top of that, what our group has been showing is if you engineer certain notches into the racetrack, these notches can actually hold your skirmions in place for fairly long times, you know, 10 year lifetime, and yet a modest amount of current can unpin them. But again, there's an, all these inequalities because if you put too much current, you get um, unwanted nucleation events. So there's a Goldilocks regime where you can operate uh, or to make this work. <laughs> so let's go back to our application, temporal dom domain computing, right? So with all these uh, attributes of a skirmion, what can we do? And again, the main, uh, take home point is think of a skirmion as a very tiny mobile magnet. And it has a linear operation. If you double the current, it'll double the speed. Right? So with these two attributes, fairly mobile and with a linear tunable behavior, there are certain classes of temporal computing you can do uh, analog computing with these kinds of uh, skirmions or domain walls if you can avoid creeping. So this came out of Dimitris Shrukov's group. It's been extended by uh, Mark Stiles' group at NIST. And we've been collaborating with Mark Stiles' group on this. So the idea is something called race logic. And the idea there is you have a racetrack, but the information's encoded in just one single wavefront coming in. It's unary computing. And the information's in the arrival time of this arriving edge. So in this case, this wavefront encodes the number two, the next one encodes the number three. Okay, so now if you want to do an add operation, all you need is a delay two unit delay that gives you an add. So it's an adder is very trivial. If you run these two uh, X prime and Y through an OR gate, it picks up the earlier one, the, the, the later one rather, the minimum operation, because you know the min is just the minimum of the two functions. So the earliest signal, which is this one is the min function is picked up by the OR gate. 
And then if you do, sorry, if you do an AND gate, then it picks up a max function. And then you can do an inhibit. Inhibit means, you know, if one of them comes before the other, it inhibits it. So there are these four operations, delay, or, AND, and inhibit. And these map onto the computational primitives, adder, min, max, and comparator. And with these four kinds of uh, operations, there's a whole class of mathematics called tropical algebra that the NIST group has kind of pointed out that we can solve with this, um, these four operations. And if you, the main thing is you need to have a memory element in there to store um, your uh, intermediate results or store your um, parameters, delays and so on. And the point we make is that these kermions can actually be the native memory, temporal memory for these kinds of logic elements. So let me give you an example. So let's say I want to solve this graph theory problem. This is a bunch of uh, nodes and there are these weights on the nodes and you're trying to find the shortest path from here to here. And this adjacency matrix is telling you the weights of the nodes and the connectivity. And so if you replace each of these nodes with an OR gate and each of these numbers with a delay, then this structure, this circuit automatically encodes the uh, fastest arrival because each OR gate will be turned on as soon as any one of its inputs is turned on. So the quickest path is automatically getting registered in this system, right? So that's a race logic. That's the idea of race logic. You just set the signal, see which one comes first, fastest, and that tells you the shortest path in some sense. The main thing is to encode the delays um, somewhere. And there's a whole class of problems that you can solve with these algorithms, right? Um, one example that the NIST group has been uh, doing or pursuing the UCSB group did in the past is uh, what is called de novo alignment of DNA base pairs. You cut DNAs into pieces and look for alignments, maximum alignment. There's text alignment of the kind that Pentic and Arvis group has been doing at UC Berkeley. Uh, there's dynamic time warping for time series similarity. These all fall, many of them at least, fall in the class of programming called dynamic programming, where the optimal solution to the entire computation can be constructed by optimal solutions of the subcomputes. So for example, if I know the shortest paths from one node to all its neighboring nodes, I can use that information to calculate the shortest path elsewhere through some algorithm. So it's a scalable. Um, and the computation only at the wave fronts. Um, but the main thing is how do you store the information, store these kinds of uh, results here. Now, you can store it on flip-flops. Uh, those are energy hungry. You can store them on memristors, which the NIST group has been doing. They are non-linear. So the nice thing about the skarmions is there's the linear transduction between space and time. And so one can imagine the skarmions encoding these delays. So here is the algorithm, for instance, that was proposed by uh, uh, Dijkstra uh, that was being pursued by the NIST group. Uh, again, the same idea. You're trying to go from one node to another node with all these weighted kind of... Uh, edges and you want to figure out what's the best way to do it. There's a very clear algorithm for uh, doing this. That's the Dijkstra algorithm. If you go to Wikipedia, it'll show you how this kind of evolves. And it looks a lot like this evolution of the wave front of this racetrack. You know, you have a bunch of skirmias that are going through, a bunch of signals that are going through. And the evolution of the wave front is encoding the uh, um, this evolution that you see here. Now they read this kind of two operations. They need a min operation and a sum operation, if you go through this algorithm, you need to find out shortest path, that's min. I need to add up the o histories, that's the sum operation. And these two kind of come out fairly naturally in this example. So here's what the min would look like if you actually did a layout. Uh, you'd have almost like a NOR gate. You see that you know, there's a signal coming in and there are all these racetracks and you program the skirmions and put them according to the delays in the different racetracks. So this is a shorter delay, it takes a lesser time. It's a longer delay that's programmed here. If you can put them in here and then whichever one gets enabled first, that executes an OR gate um, and that would be a min function. And the, uh, whatever the sum function, which in tropical algebra is multiplication, that can be obtained with a layout like this. So this can all be done, but we need a way of reading and encoding the position of the skirmion. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about for the last few slides. So here's the idea. Uh, if you see, you see in the bottom, basically what's happening, there are two racetracks. The first one is the main racetrack, which is where the skirmion has been driven. The other is called the recovery racetrack. Now you, and you have all these transistors that turn it on and off, turn all these uh, read, write circuits on and off. Uh, 
And when a signal comes in, the duty cycle of this signal determines where the skirmion and the racetrack ends. And if you can eliminate the drift of the skirmion, let's say with notches, then the skirmion should end at a point which is proportional to this um, uh, duty cycle. So that's your write operation. You're writing a analog coordinate, which is where you're programming the skirmion's delay. And then when you want to read it, what you do is you read, you read it by moving it to the end where there's a MTJ and you simultaneously launch a skirmion in the recovery. So that because when you read the skirmion, it's a destructive read. It's basically removing the coordinate information of the skirmion. The skirmion itself is always around. You assume it's prefabricated and it's just being shuttled around. Right, but you're essentially reading it, it's coordinate, and when you read it, then this the recovery skirmion encodes the information. That's the read, and then you can bring it back to base by bringing the recovery skirmion back to base, and the skirmion comes back to the original position, and then you can drive another pulse that brings it back. It's called erase. Again, you're not erasing the skirmion. What you're erasing is the coordinate information of the skirmion. So this is how you do an analog kind of information encoding with a skirmion. And so that those are the four operations. And there's a sequence of pulses you can come up with. Now, what is interesting is we can actually do the energetics of this structure. Okay, so here's the picture, for example, uh, if you blow it up, you know, each of these delays uh, is encoded inside a coordinate of a skirmion. Again, larger delay means it's further from the end, smaller delay means closer to the end. Here's what the layout kind of looks like. And each skirmion can, in this particular example, let's say encode 16 uh, time slices, 16 possible delays on a 640 nanometer racetrack. Each of this is about 40 nanometers. You're assuming about a 40 nanometer skirmion. Okay, so if I do the energetics, this is work that was done by in Spice by our collaborators. What you're seeing here is all the different operations, read, write, recovery, erase, the energy cost. And it's also showing the blow up among the different components, all the different transistors, the buffer, the MTJ, how much is the energy consumption in each of them. And you take home a couple of quick messages. One thing you see is that the magnet consumes very little energy. It's a metal after all. Uh, that's the that current is driven in a metal in the SOT spin orbit torque. So it's less than 10 femtojoule. All the energy is costs in the overhead. And that's very typical that, you know, you could have a very low energy computational fabric, let's say your magnet, but it has to interface with CMOS and CMOS will be the energy handling part. But what is interesting is because this is an analog information processing and using the analog nature of the skirmion to encode it, you can accomplish this with only eight transistors. Whereas if you were to do this all the way with CMOS from the very beginning, uh, without using a naturally analog uh, space-time converter like this skirmion, uh, these are estimates that uh, our postdoctoral fellow did. You can look at the number of transistors you would need for each of them, for the clocking, to digitize it, for the latches, for storage, for readout, et cetera. And it's 300 transistors. Now, you can still optimize it, but the point is it's many, many more transistors. So that's where the real gain is, is in the component count. And on top of that, this allows us to do some playback. You now, because you store the information, if it's non-volatile, you can store it for a while you can actually do playback and you can do multiple reads per write cycle. And then the energy delay product becomes many orders of magnitude smaller than the equivalent CMOS uh, implementation. So again, the main message is that uh, the magic here in this particular case, again, is the match between the algorithm and the architecture, the acceleration. If you have that match, then uh, just the energy hungry part of the computation, which is probably always gonna be CMOS can still be cut down in, in size, and then that's where you kind of save, uh, save in the long run. Now, there are many challenges that you need to go through, and I'm just going to list a few of these. So uh, you want to make sure the positional stability is kind of solid. Small skirmions tend to pin, large ones diffuse. We have shown, the experimental collaborators have shown a diffusion constant with an upper limit. We want to be able to demonstrate that even with these notches, so we can show smaller diffusivity, so you can hold that information for a long time. Lifetime, again, theoretically, you can get years uh, and at least seconds for um, you know, slightly smaller skirmions. This has to be experimentally demonstrated. Uh, readability is a big issue. You don't want to be able to read it with a magnet. So it needs an effective TMR, which is at least 50%. Remember, the skirmion is very tiny. If your TMR is very large, then it's not going to work. So you need a skirmion, which is at least as big as the, as the MTG. Uh, 
So there are some issues there. Mobility, I think, you know, we got a quasi-linear operation. There's this Magnus force that tends to kind of push the skirmions on the sides. And there are some ideas we've been playing with where you can engineer compensation points, compensation paths. So the, the Magnus force as the skirmion evolves automatically reaches a point where the Magnus force cancels. And you can use that as a self-focusing to kind of steer it into a racetrack. So these are all the different challenges. You know, you can kind of show this. The, you want the skirmion to not avoid the MTG. You don't want the skirmion to disappear, et cetera, et cetera. And there are severe application challenges that you have to deal with. Uh, for instance, you're not capitalizing on density. Oh, me, let me wrap up right now, uh, I think. So the main punchline is that we know that magnets can now be integrated onto CMOS. But to scale it, we need barrier engineering. And we want to go away from this Murphy's Law regime where it's not small enough and not large enough, right? Uh, so we want to be in the Goldilocks regime where it's kind of in the middle. And right now we are not yet there. So if we can make it volatile enough, then you can go probabilistic computing where the magnet gives you large swings and white noise. And then you can use in time domain a drop in replacement for an extended Kalman filter, which is useful for various kinds of temporal inferencing and based computing. And the big challenge there is to make sure that you can build small enough barriers. The opposite limit is non-volatile uh, operation with uh, solid tonic excitations. There, the attribute is that those are small, mobile, linear, and tunable. In time domain, there can be a native memory for temporal logic, like race logic, for example. There are other examples, uh, uh, automatic decision trees, and so on and so forth. They can be applicable in graph theory, pattern matching, dynamic programming, etc. There, the big challenge is the opposite, that we have to have a demo of efficient read, write, erase, retention on a single platform. So as long as these two challenges are uh, mitigated, there's a lot of interesting things we can do uh, in the time domain with these uh, magnetic systems. Okay, uh, thank you for your time and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Uh, let's thank the speaker using the uh, reaction buttons. So the talk is now open for questions. A question on Zoom, please raise your hand or type it in in the chat box and Twitch. And I'll read it for you. So, uh, are there any questions? Shen, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for the for the very interesting talk. Um, I have a question. I have a couple of questions. So I want to ask you one on slide thirty one, where you, you show that the you can use the skirmions to simulate the shortest path. Is that the the direct solution to the? Uh, I think you mentioned the, the traveling salesman's uh, problem. Uh, traveling salesman problem. Uh... Your question is, is this is this directly? This particular one is this dynamic programming Dijkstra algorithm. Uh, I don't know if the traveling salesman problem is one of those examples. It probably is, but I, I don't know off the top of my head. But it's a, they are both graph theory optimization problems. Uh, they just feel that you have a starting point, you have a ending point, you have multiple paths and- uh, without, without revisiting all of them, yeah. So it's probably, I, I, I don't know if it's exactly the same. It's, Similar. Uh, okay. If I may interject, I'm Samir. Yes, Samir, please. Is the it the program. same yeah. one? Uh, no. So actually, uh, traveling salesman comes into this class of problem called NP problems, non-deterministic polynomial problems. Okay. They require much harder solutions. So you generally dynamic program will not give you the most efficient solution to it. So Dijkstra's problem is uh, is a lot more like a lot easier in that sense. It's more like a p like a, what is called a probabilistic algorithm. Like sorry, polynomial time algorithm. So you can use dynamic programming to get to uh, TSP, but it's not guaranteed to give you like uh, the good solution all the time. It so what's the fundamental difference since you brought it up? I should okay. So yeah. the fundamental difference is that uh, the with the dynamic problem you have to kind of like make sure that the sub problems that you're having are together, they are guaranteed to kind of give you the completely like optimized problem, the main problem. In the, in the TSP, what it ends up is sometimes they actually give you the worst case solution. Like you end up like calculating some small sub problems, which look like, oh, this is the most optimal sub problem. But when you assemble it together, you get actually the worst case uh, solution. There are like examples like that. If you go in the literature, you will see that. 
So you kind of need to know, you kind of have to have the foresight to understand uh, an NP problem to solve. And that's why there are like no efficient uh, algorithms to solve NP problems. With the P problems, you can kind of enumerate the solutions mm -hmm. and therefore go through it. And, and in fact, this NP not equal to NP, you probably know that it's like a fundamental, yes. like a mathematically open challenge. So, so that's the, it kind of lies at the heart of that. Okay, thank you very much for the explanation. Can I ask you just a quick follow-up question? Uh, for the for the dynamic algorithm you're, you're talking about with the uh, again with the skirmions, and uh, it looks like in your simulations you have multiple nodes and with different paths with different delays. Now, physically, when you how do you make that? Do you make a multiple channels for the skirmion to flow? But does that mean that you're gonna have channels that cross each other will that cause a problem? And how, and how do you actually change the delay between the two, two nodes? Uh, let me make sure I understand your question. So um, let's see. Let me share the slide to make sure. I have. So like this figure, for example, is that the figure you have in mind? Uh, no, each, no, the thing is each, each racetrack yeah. only has one skirmion. Right. Because, oh, right. Okay. Right. Right. So that's the that's the thing, and that's the strength and the weakness. Of course, you know, um, strength is that your each of these has only one skirmion, so uh, each of them stores one single delay. It's a unary computing, right? So all it's doing is, uh, you know, one single wave front comes in, specifies where it needs to go, and when the computation proceeds, the delay is already stored there, and then that determines where the wave front goes. I see. I see. There is no, there's no um, conflict. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And there was another thanks. raise hand. Uh, Matthias, please go ahead. Yeah. So thanks for this very nice talk. Um, I looked a little bit into this tropical algebra and it looks like the race logic is really good where you need to do this tropical vector multiplication a lot. So what are problems where the tropical vector multiplication really helps? I mean, obviously Dijkstra, I mean, there's a paper from Mark Stiles group where they do yeah. the implementation of the Dijkstra algorithm and so on. So, but is it clear a priori what type of problems can be solved efficiently using the tropical vector multiplication? I don't know the answer to that. It's a great question. And I'd like to know the answer to that too. I mean, there's probably a class of problems and uh, which are specifically suited for this uh, min some combination uh, okay but but I, I i i don't know samin do you have an answer um so yeah i mean this is like you know adwet has been working on it so i probably shouldn't like you know presume to speak for him but from my understanding is that yeah it's basically a dynamic prop again it's like you know it's good for dynamic problems where you are if you can divide your problem up into like these kind of sum then followed by a decision problem. So like min and a decision problem, right? Like which one That's is the, the Dijkstra one? kind of, yeah. If you satisfy that every step and then history in them. In yes. The so if you can like concatenate your problem solution in that form, like, you know, some minimum, some minimum, some minimum, like build the whole computation graph that way, then I think it's a very suitable. Now, can it be done? And like, maybe you can do the complement if you require the max of instead of min, this yeah. will be good too. But Looks like those are the two operations. Like you, mm -hmm. if you can, if you all have to kind of use those two operations in some combination and those are the, so then you can solve probably using this kind of a temporal, uh, sorry, not temp the tropical algebra. Okay, I'll, I'll think about it a bit more and see where I can use raised logic. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, sure. And if you figure it out, let us know. Absolutely and vice versa. Sure. Thank you. Uh, are there any further questions? Uh, let me ask a quick one. Uh, so uh, are there any special considerations uh, when you analyze these uh, trade-offs uh, uh, if, if, if you use antiferromagnets instead of ferromagnets? Yeah, so, uh, okay, so in the case of the skirmion, uh, peri magnets are very useful because the, you know, the, the speeds are high and your sizes are small, but you need to be able to control the temperature precisely. Right to reach the uh, the operating point at the, at the composition temperature. Antiferromagnets are you know, compensated already, so they the experiments seem to suggest that antiferromagnets have much better, uh, you know, much easier uh, 
accomplishment of size and speed. Problem is uh, there are other operations you need to do with them. For example, read, right? So uh, how would you electronically read uh, an antiferromagnetic skirmia? Uh, that's an open question, right? So, and already, you know, you need in the TMR, which is reasonable, your skirmion is small enough. And there's this compensation happening. So it's not clear how much, you know, how much electronic signal you're going to get out of it to be able to do an efficient read. So they're gating, for example, you know, again, you know, you can gate it in multiple ways. You know, BCMA is one, one way of doing it. There's ionic gating. So I guess the short answer is, it's not so much about whether I can drive a skirmion, create it, et cetera, but how it would interface with the electronic substrate. Right. And, and that may end up limiting, you know, how would you be able to gate it? How do you have to read it? Et cetera. So I think those are where uh, the in compatibility of the material property with the electronics will start to play a role. And I think that's, that's what will determine. Okay. Thank you again. So um, last call for questions. I don't see any more. So let's thank uh, Professor Gash again for this interesting talk.